minutes? It said on the thing, it said uh, each it presentation said anywhere between five and seven. Three and six. Three and six. Yeah, it'll be. No, it's for oh, okay. On the document, five and seven. I was like, how is this going to be? Well, I mean, we got well, to Are we like showing out the pictures? Like, like, a, like a separate picture? Yes. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Okay, everybody. So if we take a look at six dash one, uh, you can see how short it is. So maybe I won't read it in the other notebook. Um, so let's take a look at the top here. So this is just something to remember from algebra. If you have two quantities, well, three quantities, and A is greater than B, and B is greater than C, what could we conclude then? Sure, so then I could say A is greater than C, right? Wouldn't that make sense? Yep. If A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, then A must be bigger than C. Oh, sorry. Okay, so using that idea, uh, we are going to tie this into our exterior angles here. So the measure of an exterior of an angle, blah, 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 blah. the measure of an exterior angle of a triangle is greater than, isn't it going to be greater than either one of these two remote interiors? Because isn't it true that the exterior angle is equal to the sum of these two things? So we can go ahead and say it will be greater than either remote interior angle. So in this diagram, we would know for a fact that the measure of angle three, whatever it is, is going to be greater than the measure of angle one, and we would also know that the measure of angle three is going to be greater than the measure of angle two. I don't know how angles one and two compare to each other. Um, I have no idea, but I know that three would be greater than either one of them individually. Okay, just one little note too, when we are using inequalities and the angle symbol at the same time, they can get really confusing because it's basically the same shape. So I always try and make my inequality symbols like ridiculously big, like over-exaggerate, so I don't confuse them with an angle symbol. So just to keep in mind, because if you're writing them all and they look exactly the same, sometimes you get super confused. I'm like, what am I even trying to say? I have no idea what's going on here. Um, but so use that helpful tip. Uh, that's really it for 6-1. My gosh, why don't we just get 6-2 done right now? Okay, I love this enthusiasm. Yes, let's just go for it. Okay, so 6-2, um, so we've been refreshing our memory on these conditional statements, the hypothesis and conclusion, the converse and the biconditional. So um, I guess it's worth throwing an example up here real quick. So a conditional, see, this is why I don't always love the, the printed ones because I don't have room to do anything. But anyway, so a conditional statement, for example, could be, um, let's do if, Uh, let's do the, the Boston one. If you live in Boston, then you live in Mass. So that is what we refer to as a conditional statement. They're typically set up as a if this, then that. So we look for that if then, okay. Hypothesis and conclusion. Do you remember where the hypothesis is? It's the chunk of the sentence that comes after the word if usually, okay? So, um, cause sometimes we have conditionals that don't have the word if in them, um, but you can always rewrite it so that it does. If you live in Boston. So just that chunk, we actually don't include the word if. So there is my hypothesis. which if you remember, we used a symbol P to represent the hypothesis. And then 
Uh, the conclusion was which part? Right, it's the chunk that comes after the word then. So in this case, it would be the you live in mass. So there is my conclusion, which is represented by the letter Q. If we're going to write it symbolically. All right, and then what was the deal with the converse? Exactly, you're gonna swap the two. So my converse of this statement would read, see, I have nowhere to put it. I'll stick it right up here. If you live in mass, then you live in Boston. Is that a true statement? No, so it is very easy for an original statement and its converse to not have the same, we call it a truth value. The forward, the original statement was true. If you live in Boston, then yes, you do live in Massachusetts, but the converse in this case is not true. So it would have a false truth value, okay? Because obviously that's not true. We could provide a counter example. I assume none of you live in Boston. Does anybody not live in Massachusetts? Any Connecticut people here? That can happen, I think, right? I think you can school choice for Connecticut. Yeah. We're so close. Yeah, yeah. You can? So all of you would be a counterexample because all of you live in Massachusetts, but none of you live in Boston at this time. Okay, so, um, and then, oh wait, symbolically, if we wanna do converse, you do Q then P, remember those arrows? So the conditional was P then Q, that's our original. The hypothesis is P, the conclusion is Q. So the converse, you swap the two, you get Q then P. And then what was that deal with the biconditional? That's the one where you join the two using the words if and only if. Now, in this case, if I tried to do that and I tried to write the biconditional, it wouldn't be a true biconditional because it's not true forwards and backwards. When you have a statement that's true originally and the converse is true, you can join them together to create a true biconditional. I can write the biconditional, but it's going to be false, right? So it would say, uh, you live in mass if and only if you live in Boston. Not true, um, but that's how you would write the biconditional. So it's symbolically, that's the one that we had the double headed arrow, because you could go either way. Uh, and that's the if and only if. So I'll, uh, I'll write it, but um, yeah, it would not be a true one. So this would be, you live in mass. Do you remember the shortcut for writing if and only if? If you're feeling lazy? Double F. Yeah, double F, I, F, F. Okay, so in this case, that is a false biconditional. That is not a true statement. Um, usually we only join them together when it's true. Whenever you are writing a definition, you want to write it as a biconditional whenever possible, because then, uh, so for example, I wouldn't want to say, uh, I mean, uh, well, no. Yeah, if I said something like a rhombus is a shape that has four sides. I mean, that's true, but it's not a good definition because if I went the other way, a shape that has four sides is a rhombus, is that true? Definitely not. But if I word it in such a way that it would be true forward and backwards, that would be a good definition. So if I said something like a rhombus is a four-sided figure where all four sides are equal, that makes sense because then if I said, if a shape is, has four sides and all four sides are equal, then it's a rhombus. That would be true both ways, okay? So there's by conditional. Okay, so anyway, that's all old news. We talked about that way back in chapter two, I think it was. Um, so we're gonna talk about some new pieces. Negation, the opposite of a statement. So that's when I literally just say the opposite thing. So I would say for our example, if you don't live in Boston, then you don't live in Massachusetts if I want to negate any of those pieces, okay? So negation, 
uh, symbolically, we would put a squiggle in front of it. So we would literally say not P or not Q. So when you negate both of them, what you have created is the inverse. So my statement that I just said, if you don't live in Boston, then you don't live in Massachusetts, that would be the inverse of my original conditional. So this inverse as a symbol would be not P then not Q. So for our example, if you don't live in Boston, then you don't live in Mass. Just like with negative numbers, like if you want negative, negative three, it becomes positive three, right? So if your original statement had a, had a not in it, then it would just come back to being true. So for example, if I said, um, if you don't clean your room, then you can't go to the movies. If that's my original and you wanted the inverse of that, I would say, if you do clean your room, then you can go to the movies. You know what I'm saying? Okay. All right, and then the last one is this contrapositive business. What in the world? Contrapositive. That is a conditional where the hypothesis and conclusion have been both negated and switched. So it's basically doing the inverse and the converse at the same time, it's doing both of them. You're gonna flip it and negate it. And the way I remember which one's which, uh, Converse, honestly, I think of the sneaker brand and I always, I don't know why I think of it in my head, but you can switch your sneakers so I can switch the sentence. I don't know, that has stuck in my brain for all these years. So Converse, you just switch them. Um, inverse, I mean, you, I don't know, I always just think of algebra. So if I'm doing the inverse in algebra, sort of the same idea. I just wanna do like the opposite, right? And then contrapositive is this big long word so I'm going to do this big, long amount of work, meaning I'm going to switch it and negate it. The most work I can do to a sentence is what you're doing with the punch positive. So our statement would read, uh, so for our example, if my original, where was it? If you live in Boston, then you live in Massachusetts. So I'm going to negate them both and I'm going to flip it. So I would say, if you don't live in Massachusetts, then you don't live in Boston. See how we did both? We negated and we switched. And that gives you the contra positive. So was that so bad? Oh, I gotta show you in symbols, contra positive would be not Q, then not P, right? Because you're switching and negating. Oh, I'm so sorry. There we go. Not Q, then not P. And there it is. That's it. How do we feel? Good -ish? Okay, let me stop this one. I'm so glad that we got this out of the way. Uh, so, and 